Good afternoon. I'd like to call the meeting of the Board of Public Utilities for the City of Santa Rosa to order. If we may have a roll call, please. Board Member Wright. Board Member Watts. Board Member Walsh. Here. Board Member Bartholo. Here. Board Member Badenfort. Here. Vice Chair Arnone. Here. Chair Galvin. Here. Okay. Thank Let you. Go ahead, sorry. Let the record reflect all board members are present with the exception of board members Wright and Watts. Thank you. We'll now move to item two, statements of abstention by board members. Board member Walsh. Mr. Chairman, I'll uh, recuse myself from item 7.1, the mitigated negative declaration um, of family members, Chief of the Federated Indians, Great Rancheria. All right, any other statements of abstention? Very good, we have no study session. Item number four is the minutes from the May 4th meeting. So at this time we'll take public comments on the minutes approval. If you wish to make a comment via Zoom, please raise your hand. If you're dialing in via telephone, please dial star nine to raise your hand. Secretary Ledesma. We have no one making their way to the podium. We do not have any hands raised in Zoom. No public comments were received via email or voicemail. Very good. The minutes then will be approved and entered. We'll now move to our staff briefings. Uh, item 5.1, Director Burke. Thank you, Chair Galvin and members of the board. Our first staff briefing is Water Professionals Appreciation Week. And Elise Miller, our communications coordinator, will make the presentation. Right. Thank you for the introduction. Let me just get this up. Where is our share screen? Got this. And there we go. All right. Good afternoon, Chair Galvin and members of the board. I'm Elise Miller and I'm here today to share how Santa Rosa Water and the city will be celebrating National Public Works Week. So celebrating our public works professionals is very important uh, because they provide essential services to our community. Uh, they are responsible for maintaining, repairing, rehabilitating, and building new and vital infrastructure. Uh, like our water delivery, wastewater collection, water reuse, and stormwater systems. This year, from May 21st through the 27th, the City of Santa Rosa will be celebrating our public works professionals by sharing a series of stories across the city's various social media channels, receiving a proclamation at City Council on Tuesday, May 23rd, and hosting the third annual City Works Festival at Santa Rosa's Wednesday night market uh, in Courthouse Square. To share Santa Rosa Water's story, as well as our coworkers in parks and transportation and public works, Santa Rosa will highlight the infrastructure, the facilities, and the serv services provided by our public works professionals. These professionals include engineers, technicians and employees at all levels of government as well as the private sector. And they are responsible for our shared transportation system, residential and arterial streets, lights and signals, water distribution, sewer collection systems, treatment and water reuse systems, parks and amenities, public buildings and other structures and facilities. So these stories and more will be shared on the city's Facebook and Instagram pages, as well as in Santa Rosa City Connections e-newsletter. In order to recognize Santa Rosa's public works professionals and their contributions, Santa Rosa uh, City Council will present a proclamation to parks, transportation and public works and water staff at the Tuesday, May 23rd council meeting. Representatives from our water team will inclu include Andrew Allen, supervising engineer and asset management, Flannery Banks, assistant engineer in stormwater, and Elvis Shipman, our senior utility system operator in the meter shop. To provide an opportunity, 
uh, for our community to interact with these public works professionals. Santa Rosa is hosting our third annual City Works Festival on May 24th at Santa Rosa's Wednesday night market from 5 to 8.30 p.m. And the City Works Festival will be located on 4th Street between Mendocino Avenue and D Street. And the festival will feature a cleaning demo, a camera truck, a scavenger hunt, and plenty of big equi equipment to climb aboard and explore. So this is really an interactive event, and it's designed for all ages, and I encourage you all to attend. You can learn more at srcity.org forward slash your city works. And in closing, I would just like to say thank you to all of our public works professionals, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Ms. Miller. Appreciate the comments and uh, the report on what should be a fun week. I'll open it up now for any board member questions or comments. All right, hearing none, we'll open it up for public comment on item 5.1. If you wish to make a comment via Zoom, <clears throat> please raise your hand. If you're dialing in via telephone, please dial star nine to raise your hand. Secretary Ledesma. We do not have anyone at the podium, no hands raised in Zoom, and no public comments were received, received via Zoom, uh, or excuse me, email or phone. Very good, that'll take care of item 5.1. We'll now move to item 5.2, Director Burke. Thank you, Chair Galvin and members of the board. Item 5.2 is our second staff briefing, and it'll be the 2022-2023 Capital Improvement Project Update. And Tracy Duenas, our supervising engineer with our CIP teams, will be making the presentation. Good afternoon, Chair Galvin, members of the board. My name is Tracy Duenas, Supervising Engineer with Tra uh, Transportation and Public Works. Uh, today I'll bring before you the staff briefing for the fiscal year 22-23 Capital Improvement Project update. Uh, it's been some time since we've been here, so we've got a bit to cover. I'll try to make it quick and as expeditious as possible. So with that, um, I'm going to cover a few things, that being the completed projects for fiscal year 22-23, um, projects that are currently um, in construction that previously been bid and are actively in construction, and we'll forecast some anticipated projects uh, that we know of for fiscal year 23. So completed in fiscal 22-23, we had five projects completed um, of those projects. Two were primarily sewer, three were primarily re reuse, um, and then we had various what we call on-calls, which is re reuse or local on-calls, as we call it. Um, to segregate the definition, sewer is primarily sewer funds, water is primarily water funds, and reuse is what we've known as sub-regional funds. And so just think of sewer and water as local, if you will, reuse being sub-regional. So total cost spent um, in total construction was a little over 15.2 million. Um, of those costs, approximately 90% were local sewer, 7% was reuse. As we dive into the actual projects, we'll, do, we'll, go, we'll highlight some of those, that being the Crosstown Trunk Lining project in particular. So this project was uh, in an effort to rehabilitate approximately 1,000 linear square feet of um, sewer main along the Crosstown alignment. Um, with that, we, we installed what is, what is known as cured in place pipe technology uh, in an effort to re rehabilitate that. In line with that sewer trunk was five manholes we also rehabbed. Um, in an effort to, to do the construction requires an extensive bypass. 
Uh, this bypass comprised of approximately 5.5 million gallons per day, which is essentially a quarter of the city's sewerage. Um, it was required in order to build the project. The distribution system ran parallel, if you will, or adjacent to the Santa Rosa Creek within Prince Memorial uh, Trail. It traveled under 101, under 1 Smart. It traveled over two city bridges and it had a vertical drop, very extensive and elaborate. Um, it also had to uh, co-mingle with the 22 Marath Santa Rosa Marathon. So uh, the project team accomplished that. Um, in the end, the project did uh, complete in winter of 2022 at a, a total construction cost of 1.6 million. Next project, you've heard this, the North Trunk Sewer Replacement Project. Um, this project was in, in an effort to relocate um, existing sewerage that was in the Pollen Creek Corridor. We needed to re relocate that into the Sinead Corridor, uh, coupled with the fact that that was um, vintage 1950s sewerage. Um, the alignment uh, had uh, very little access, so in an effort to minimize risk or exposures to the city, uh, in an ability to re um, get the uh, trunk out of, out of uh, the water course that oftentimes would travel under or near it, we relocated in the Sinead Corridor. So this project involved um, installing approximately 2,000 square feet, 2,000 feet of main in Sinead, um, some of which was actual board, referred to, and this technology was a trenchless boring effort. This, these photos here show the extents of the shaft, in some cases 40 feet deep. Uh, the pipe that was installed was a vitrified clay pipe with steel casing. That pipe was specced in order due to the axial loads that were thrust upon it with this, this kind of machinery. So um, the project also involved an extensive detour from uh, Sinead through um, Parker Hill to Fountain Grove Parkway uh, in an effort as most required as part of most of the project. Um, that project was complete in winter of 22 at an construction value of a little under 2 million, uh, 12 million, excuse me. So a couple projects out of the plant. These were covered under a minor contract, so you would have not have seen these, but this is the Laguna Treatment Plant Maintenance Building Project, uh, Improvement Project. This is in uh, response to a leaky roof out of the maintenance building. Um, the over winter, the water would infiltrate the roof and would subject the equipment and staff to hazards. So we, through an urgent track, we put this project out. We replaced the existing built up roof with uh, what is known as a, a thermoplastic polyethylene material, which has a 20 year life. We completed that project in um, summer of last year at a value of a little under 200,000. Adjacent to that was also the lab chiller replacement. So this project um, replaced antiquated chiller equipment system out there that was running nearly 50% capacity uh, and it was ancillary to the climate control serving the lab chiller extension room. Um, that room is, has extensive uh, temperature sen sensitive analyses involved, so it was important imperative that we repaired that as expeditiously as possible. We did, we completed that in fall of 2022 at a value a little under uh, 300,000 as well. And lastly is the Delta Pond Diffuser Maintenance Project. Um, this project essentially is a, just a glorified large maintenance project. Uh, you guys, uh, board has seen this previously twice. Um, it was in response to um, a phenomenon which we known the diffuser had impeded uh, sediment around it. Um, the diffuser was originally constructed in, in 2010 and over the course of that time uh, has accumulated much sediment through Santa Rosa Creek. Um, the diffuser is in the Santa Cruz, Santa Creek proper. It's comprised of many duck bell, duck, um, I'm sorry, duck bill check valves, um, which as in essence is the main discharge um, or the primary recycled water discharge facility for the entire city. So over the years, uh, the sediment would, would compile and with this effort was to remove that. In an effort to do that, it's more, mainly a dredging operation where in fact you'd see a large excavator like this is shown up here, remove sediment uh, close to the vicinity of the check valve. And when we got clo closer, the op uh, contractor would deploy divers to actually vacuum um, 
vacuum clean out near the perimeter of the duck bills in an effort to not damage the bills. And then while we were mid, mid job, we actually had, we had the opportunity to actually rotate, and that's a picture of the valves themselves, but we were able to rotate those valves under executed field change order uh, in concert with the approval of the board for a change of scope uh, work. We completed that in immense, in addition to all the issues we had and, and constraints we had and challenges we had in design and construction, one of the more pressing thing was the regulatory schedule deadline to get out of the creek by October 15th and the team managed to do that. And we also achieved that job with a little under 550,000. So as we look at the projects today in construction, um, we have a total of 12. Um, of those 12, again, it's broken down into uh, the sewer water, which actively we have four. We have four just primarily water and five primarily reuse. We also anticipate, as we have every year, uh, some kind of engagement in the uh, on-calls, whether that be reuse or, or local. Um, the value of the 27.7 uh, million is essentially a, a total of either the base construction cost, base construction cost, or the total for the entire certified work to date. Uh, it's actively moving, there's a lot of projects, but in essence, it may not cover all the extra work. So if we look at the, these projects in particular, um, the four local sewer and water projects, with, which uh, evaluate a little under 15 million, um, three of those are your standard sewer and water projects, neighborhood type projects, which re replace sewer and water with some kind of street re rehabilitation. Um, those projects are the Cleveland Avenue and Rose District, the Terra Linda and Buena Vista sewer and water, the Slater Street and La Rosa Way, as well as the backup generator serving the waste, the water and wastewater facilities. We assume all of these projects to be complete by this year. Uh, special note, uh, the backup generators uh, serving water and wastewater facilities. So this project was in response to the Tubbs fire of 2017. Uh, it was in part of a greater effort to make the city's infrastructure uh, more resilient and hardened against future hazards. Um, this project replaced dual fuel, that being propane and diesel, or excuse me, propane and natural gas with straight diesel. Uh, the project replaced its infrastructure serving, mind you, 18 various water and wastewater facilities. So the project replaced uh, with straight diesel generators um, and in that, in concert, it, it improved the power capacities. It uh, had an opportunity to transition to more re reliable fuel and reduced overall greenhouse emissions. Um, funding for this, the city acquired um, through the FEMA Hazardous Mitigation Grant Program funds through Cal EOS, Cal EOS, Cal OES, excuse me, that provided an opportunity for 75% reimbursement um, for design, total construction, including the procurement of the generators um, and construction management costs. So that total project construction cost, the base construction cost is approximately 9.2 million. As we look at just straight water projects, they comprise of a little under 5.5 million. Uh, that being the control and radio upgrades, the water tank tree removal, the emergency well public state public pump station place to play, and the cobblestone drive R2 to R4 water main connection. Um, these all are anticipated to be complete this well this year as well. And as we look at uh, drill down into a highlighted project, um, this project's been before the board twice now, the controller and radio upgrade specific to just local water. Um, this project scope replaced antiquated and obsolete equipment um, out uh, over f uh, serving, um, excuse me, replaced antiquated and obsolete equipment with programmable logic controller upgrades at 19 various pump stations and radio telemetry upgrades at 41 local operation facilities. So in, that, in essence, that this, the breadth, if you will, of the project limits was quite vast. Um, currently, this project is completing its first phase, that being the radio telemetry upgrades, and we should here within the next month have uh, a next phase of the PLC upgrades forthcoming. Um, that project base cost is approximately 1.6 million. So looking at just the water reuse projects, those, some, uh, they, those total of uh, approximately 7.5 million. Again, this is total construction. 
uh, base cost with assumed uh, work certified total, that being the LTP chill chillers and climate control upgrades, the LTP waste gas burner replacement, the LTP emergency generator fuel tank slash station, the West College storage facility pumping improvements, and the Geysers Delta Connection improvements. Um, all of these, aside from the um, emergency generator uh, out at the plant, where um, these are slated to be complete this year. Of highlight, uh, we'll look at the LTP waste gas burner replacement. So this project is to facilitate uh, biogas handling. The project's replacing an aged, uh, beyond useful life candlestick type waste gas burner with a new skid mounted enclosed barrack biogas waste burner system that you could see on this photo here. It's a, it's a, a tall tower. Uh, you'll see the gentleman to the far right corner, so it gives a scale of, of the extents of this improvement. Um, and it's specified to achieve high destruction efficiencies greater than 99%. So we, this base construction cost is two million. Uh, adjacent to that is the, the emergency generator fuel tank station replacement, also out at the plant. Um, this is in pursuant to the PG&E's um, unpredictable frequency in implementing its public safety power shutoff, aka PSPS. Um, so the plant identified the need to replace its aged diesel fuel uh, emergency generator fuel storage with new uh, above ground storage tanks, a new f dual fuel diesel gasoline above storage tank, and a new fuel diesel gasoline dispensing station. Uh, this base cost of construction is approximately 1.3 million. And lastly for reuse is the Delta uh, Connection Improvement Project. Uh, this is in an effort to improve system resiliency, in, in essence. Its project purpose is to increase plant's capacity to divert recycled water from the geysers pipeline to Delta Pond, which is the main recycle discharge point for sub-regional. Uh, this project involved the installation of new distribution pipe, uh, installation of a new spillway facility, and the installation of a new energy dissipation system. Uh, approximate base cost was $2 million. So as we look forward, um, we anticipate four projects that are, will be bid in fiscal year 23, um, that being two sewer and water, one water, and one primarily sewer. Um, the total anticipated engineer, it, the total cost of being 14.7, again, that cost is a total of either the engineering estimate or the total base construction cost as we know it as of today. As we look at the sewer and water, primarily it is the Albany, Clement, and Milano sewer and water and the East Haven Drive sewer and water improvement projects. These two are your bread and butter sewer replacement projects that replace aged sewer and water and bring them up to current standards as well improve fire protection in the, in the uh, neighborhoods. Uh, these are both slated for start of construction uh, this summer. As we look at just the water project, that is the water pump station one retaining wall, that's in an effort to rehabilitate um, migrating water penetrating through the wall. Uh, estimated cost at that is a little under 200,000 and we do anticipate start of construction that this summer as well. And lastly is the large Los Alamos trunk sewer replacement. Uh, this project, in essence, will replace sections of the existing Los Alamos trunk system that are either in poor condition or undersized to serve future demand. So this project uh, involves installation of approximately 5,700 linear feet um, between stream side and E-Lane e Drive. Um, it will traverse and over, well, in essence, 55% of the alignment will be an unimproved area. Uh, it would also require an extensive bypass system to convey upwards of 1.5 million gallons per day. In an effort to minimize public and business disturbance, it will also have portions of the work uh, either at nighttime or some of the work that's in Highway 12, actually weekend work. Um, this construction cost is 8.8 .8 million, and we assume it to be starting construction this summer. Apologize for the quickness, but we are here. Uh, CIP's webpage is still up and active. It is located at srcity.org slash CIP. Um, there, 
the public will have the opportunity to see projects either in design, primarily in construction. They have a map or a list format to navigate through. It provides details, contacts, start ending estimated times of construction, um, as well as costs. Um, and it gives the public a good opportunity to see what's upcoming. It also provides an update, uh, update for con current construction. And lastly, I want to provide or give an opportunity for sta staff appreciation. Um, within t uh, t TPW, there's two primary teams that serve specifically for water enterprise fund uh, CIP. That's team two and team three. Uh, within each two of those, th in each two, in each both of those teams, comprised of essentially uh, 12, uh, 10 folks. I'll list them real quick, but that's made up of associate, associate civil engineering classification. And that would be Sarah Matthews serving under team two. That would be Rochella Maeda and Andy Wilt serving team three at the quality associate, the quality control associate level. That's Chris Huffman and Dave Keck serving team two and team three respectively. Civil engineering technician that would be Oscar Serrano and Mike Merrick and Tim Sell, as well as the administrative support, that being uh, Joyce Brandvold and uh, Allison Grongio. Um, as you can see with this, uh, it highlights the somewhat deficiency in the staffing, um, but we have been performing and we continue will do so. And with that, um, I will take any questions. Thank you, Mr. Duenas. I'll open up for any board member questions or comments. Board member Walsh. I, I appreciate the high level report of, uh, of, of what you recently completed, what you've gotten, what you have in progress and what you plan to do. Um, the report falls directly in line with the concern we heard recently about how much capacity that we have, uh, and this shows that you're, you're getting a lot done, and I very much appreciate it. And I'm just kind of looking for who, who all's in here that's worked on those projects, because I want to say thank you very much for getting the work done, and uh, we appreciate it. All right. Thanks for calling out staff. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Other board member questions or comments? All right, we'll open it up for public comment on item 5.2. If you wish to make a comment via Zoom, please raise your hand. If you're dialing in via telephone, please dial star nine to raise your hand. Secretary Ledesma. We have no one at the podium, no hands are raised in Zoom, and no voicemails or emails were received. Very good, thanks again, Mr. Duenas. Thank you. That'll take care of item 5.2. We have one item on the consent calendar. If there are any questions from the board, otherwise I'll entertain a motion. I'll move adoption of the consent items. I'll second the motion. We have a motion and a second to approve item 6.1. We'll now open it up for public comment on item 6.1. If you wish to make a comment via Zoom, please raise your hand. If you're dialing in via telephone, please dial star nine to raise your hand. Secretary Ledesma. We have no one at the podium, no hands raised in Zoom, and no voicemails um, or emails were received. Thank you, may we have a roll call vote, please? Thanks. Board Member Walsh? Aye. Board Member Bartho Bartholo? Aye. Board Member Badenfort? Aye. Vice Chair Arnone? Aye. And Chair Galvin? Aye. This passes with five, five affirmative votes with Board Member Watts and Board Member Wright absent. Thank you. We'll now move to item 7.1, which is our first report item, Director Burke. Thank you. And we'll give Board Member Walsh just a second. So item 7.1 is our first report item, adoption of a mitigated negative declaration and mitigation monitoring and reporting program and approval of project for the Laguna Treatment Plant Flood Protection Project. And uh, with me this afternoon presenting, we will have Andy Wilt, our Associate Civil Engineer, and Christine Gaspar from our consulting firm, GHD.
Okay, good afternoon, Chair Galvin and members of the board. I'm Andy Wilt, civil engineer with Public Works. I'm here with Christine Gaspar, senior environmental planner from GHD. Today we'll be presenting the Laguna Treatment Plant Flood Protection Project Mitigated Negative Declaration. So first I'll go over the project background, uh, including the location and floodplain analysis. Then I'll uh, go over the scope of the proposed uh, project. Then Christine will discuss the California Environmental Quality Act, more commonly known as the CEQA. Uh, then we'll provide a recommendation and be available to answer any questions. So the project is located at the Laguna Treatment Plant on Yano Road between Highway 116 and Todd Road. It's also sandwiched between the Laguna de Santa Rosa to the south and Colgan Creek to the north, uh, both of which are potential sources of floodwaters. So in 2018, Schaff and Wheeler completed a floodplain analysis. The light blue shading on this uh, drawing represents the FEMA 100-year floodplain. It's clear, clearly showing that LTP would be impacted by floodwaters coming up from the Laguna. You can see how that shaded area penetrates up into the plant. The red lines on this drawing uh, represent the proposed uh, berm. And you can see that where that berm is located, it would block that water from traveling north up into the plant. So to remove the um, treatment plant from FEMA's flood maps, the improvements uh, must comply with FEMA criteria. Um, and to be compliant, the elevation of the berm must be at least three feet above the 100-year flood water surface elevation or four feet near an obstruction. So in this case, there's an obstruction along the Laguna, which is the Yano Road Bridge. So it also must be above the 500-year flood water surface elevation. So over the last 15 years, the city has received uh, three consultant opinions on what this 500-year water surface elevation is, the most severe of which is 92 feet. So that's what was selected uh, for the design height of the, of the flood protection wall. Now the elevation of the south entrance into LTP is approximately elevation 85. So that would give you an idea, at least in that location, as to uh, what the height of this uh, berm would be. So the purpose of this project is to protect LTP from flood events that occur when water overtops the banks of the Laguna to the south of LTP and Colgan Creek uh, to the north. The flood protection system includes uh, earthen berms shown in red, a floodgate across Yano Road, warning lights and barrier arms at two locations on Yano Road, and a stormwater system to remove the stormwater from LT LTP to outside of those berms. Now this project was awarded uh, a community development block grant uh, from HUD and also a hazard mitigation grant from FEMA. So combined, those grants will fund most of this project. Uh, approximately 90% of it will be funded by those grants. So this rendition provides an idea of the scale and location uh, of the proposed berm. So the line work in light blue or aqua color uh, represents the proposed berm and you can see how it is in relation to the other facilities out there. So the stormwater system will collect stormwater from LTP and it'll gravity flow directly to the Laguna or it could gravity flow to the new stormwater pump station. Now this uh, stormwater pump station is currently under construction uh, by the disinfection and diversion project. Now, uh, the plant operations will have the flexibility then to use this pump station to pump the water either directly to the Laguna or up to the equalization basins and then through the treatment process at the plant. So this would, you know, allow operations, for example, if there's any spill at the plant, that, that the liquid spill could be um, directed to the pump station and then pumped up through and treated. 
Uh, also, maybe uh, for a first flush event, like after a long summer, you might have sediment, dust accumulate on the roads. You could collect that water as it washes down on that first rain event into the pump station and then treat it. So this photo of, uh, of the proposed floodgate is kind of in the normal flat position. They've been installed in state highways. They're uh, rated for uh, traffic loading. Our installation will include uh, raising the profile of Yano Road approximately two feet in the area of this gate um, so that minor flooding will not activate the gate. So when the floodwaters rise from the Laguna, uh, the proposed five foot tall uh, floodgate in Yano Road, it'll passively lift up into position to protect the facilities from floodwaters. It has hinges along one edge, and so it'll basically, it basically floats up into position. So as that water rises, it floats up into position. There's no power needed. If it happens in the middle of the night after a big storm event and you know all the power's out, this thing will still activate to protect the facilities. Doesn't need any uh, personnel there to operate it. Uh, it's just all, autom it just does it by itself. So as, previ as previously stated, um, we plan to add two warning signs and barrier gates. Uh, one will be located south of the Laguna, the other north of the Laguna, just north of the floodgate. This will prevent vehicles from driving into the uh, flooded area. Now, Yano Road here is not a city road, it's a Sonoma County road. So we're working on an agreement with the county. Um, for the city to maintain this equipment. So it'll be our responsibility. So what will this proposed berm look like? Uh, well, most of, the, most of the public will see it as they're traveling along Yano Road driving. So this uh, initial photo here um, is Yano Road looking south. The south entrance to LTP is that driveway on the left of the trees just beyond that are adjacent to the Laguna. So this is kind of the before photo. So here you see the um, a rendition that depicts the proposed berm, what it may look like from that same location, looking south on Yano Road. So this is kind of the after photo. So I'll just back up again so that you can see the before. So here's the before photo. And here's the after photo. So next, uh, Christine Gaspar from GHD will explain the CEQA. Good afternoon, Chairman Galvin, members of the board. The CEQA process is essentially a public disclosure process where we identify the environmental impacts of a proposed project and then also determine what avoidance measures, mitigation measures, or um, uh, other uh, project modifications that can be implemented to reduce the impacts of a project. This is done not only for you as the decision makers, but also for the public and state agencies who might also have um, some type of authority or approval over the process. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, for this process, um, that the city uh, decided that the appropriate CEQA documentation would be an initial study, proposed mitigated negative declaration. Uh, early in the process, the city sent out tribal notification letters um, and did receive response from one tribe that they wished to consult. Uh, so the city did um, uh, go through that process and that's summarized in the project description. <clears throat> Uh, once the initial study was prepared and ready for circulation, a notice of intent was sent out to um, neighboring property owners and it was also posted at the county clerk and then also uh, in the Press Democrat, um, those first days of circulation. The initial study itself was made available 
uh, on the city's website for the public to review. Uh, there was a hard copy over at the offices at 69 Stoney. And then uh, we, of course, submitted it to the state clearinghouse as well so that state agencies could review it. Uh, the public comment period very inconveniently was over the holidays, so instead of doing the traditional 30-day circulation period, the city opted to extend it a week to give folks additional time to review the document and provide any comments. Uh, there was one comment letter received from um, California Department of Fish and Wildlife. Uh, they asked questions about the wetland conditions and the potential need for additional plant surveys. Um, they also let us know what the requirements were for completing a lake and street bed alteration um, agreement for the project. Um, and I believe there is the response in your packet regarding that. Um, we did provide them with information about the conditions of the, the wetlands and you know, they're, they're not that great at, at the LTP. Um, they're degraded just by virtue of, you know, it's an industrial facility. Um, and then also, even though the CEQA document did not identify a need to do additional plant surveys, the city is conducting some additional spring surveys uh, this year. There's going to be three, and actually the first two have already been complete, and uh, no plants, no special status plants have been found thus far. And there was no other comments received. Uh, so in summary, um, the project was evaluated uh, and noticed in accordance with the CEQA guidelines. Um, all of the potential impacts that were identified um, were found to be less than significant after mitigation. Uh, those were related to biological resources and tribal cultural resources. Uh, no other uh, impacts were identified. Uh, and there was no unavoidable impacts, thus an EIR didn't need to be prepared. The conclusionary analysis, or the conclusions in the analysis, there we go, uh, supported the uh, MND uh, doing a mitigated negative declaration, and a mitigation monitoring and reporting program has been prepared in accordance with CEQA and uh, is included in your packet and would be implemented with the project. And I think I turn it back over to you. So it is recommended by the Transportation and Public Works Department and the Water Department that the Board of Public Utilities by resolution, number one, adopt the mitigated negative declaration for the Laguna Treatment Plant Flood Protection Project. Number two, adopt the mitigation monitoring and reporting program Number three, approve the Laguna Treatment Plant Flood Protection Project. And number four, direct staff to file a notice of determination. So we're here to answer any questions. Thank you both for the presentation. I'll open it up for board member questions or comments. Board member Bartholow. <clears throat> Thank you for the presentation. Um, and if you stated this in the beginning of it, I apologize, but what is the timeline for this once this gets going? So we are hoping to start construction next summer, but there's a lot of moving parts. So, um, you know, there are uh, hurdles that need to be overcome before we can start, but we are shooting for next summer. And then I think we expect it, do you remember what the timeline is? I think it's a, a year and a half to two years. Any other board member questions or comments? If not, we have a resolution before us. I'll move adoption of the resolution to the Board of Public Utilities of the City of Santa Rosa adopting a mitigated de negative declaration and mitigation monitoring and reporting program and approving the project for the Laguna Treatment Plant Flood Protection Project and waive the reading of the text. Second. 
Thank you. We have a motion by Vice Chair Arnone, seconded by Board Member Badenfort. At this time, we'll open it up for public comments on item 7.1. If you wish to make a comment via Zoom, please raise your hand. If you're dialing in via telephone, please dial star 9 to raise your hand. Secretary Ledesma. We have no one at the podiums, no hands raised in Zoom, and no voicemails or emails were received. Very good. May we have a roll call vote, please? Board Member Bartholo? Yes. Board Member Badenfort? Yes. Mm -hmm. Vice Chair Arnone? Aye. Chair Galvin? Aye. This passes with four affirmative votes with Board Members Walsh, Watts, and Wright absent. Very good. We'll wait for Board Member Walsh to make his way back to the dais. We will now move to item 7.2, Director Burke. Thank you, Chair Galvin and members of the board. Our second report item is approval of a proposed agreement for removal of microgrid demonstration project battery, transformer, and inverter at the Laguna Treatment Plant. And Peter Martin, Deputy Director Water Resources, will be making the presentation. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Galvin and members of the board. Uh, very pleased before you today. Um, it's been some time since this board has received any updates on this project, so I will spend a little time reorienting everyone on its uh, history and purpose uh, as far as a uh, demonstration project. So uh, we'll start with the beginning. Uh, there was quite a bit of coordination uh, in, in time around 2014. Uh, when ultimately Train secured a, about a $5 million uh, grant from the California Energy Commission. And the grant's purpose really was to look at opportunities uh, for utilizing microgrids and pairing them with large users like wastewater facilities. <coughs> um, and the project site uh, was selected, which was the Laguna Treatment Plant and partnering with Santa Rosa. Uh, and the goals of the project were, were relatively simple. Um, it was to fund the testing and demonstrate the operation of microgrid technology, uh, utilizing and pairing it with renewable energy opportunities, um, and evaluate any opportunities where there could be a participation in energy markets utilizing the microgrid, whether it be uh, demand reduction or sending energy back to the grid uh, and, and selling it as well at some point. So. Um, in 2017, the city signed uh, an agreement for the design and construction of the microgrid with train. Uh, that construction concluded and testing began in 2019. So there's relatively uh, large elements of this project that worked in concert with each other, um, and they were a 2.2 megawatt um, battery array, uh, controller, and various appurtenances, including an inverter, um, and uh, two selective catalytic reducers, also known as SCRs, that were installed on two of the four existing combined heat and power units that are at the facility that generate power on site. Um, and then also a 125 kilowatt solar array in the parking lot uh, near the admin building of the Laguna Treatment Plant. Some photos here of the interior of the battery array microgrid and inverter. Um, you may recognize or may not recognize some of these folks. Uh, they've since some since retired, um, but uh, you know these are uh, were critical folks that were here when this project was brought online. Uh, the two SCR units uh, they truly uh, act just like a, a large. Um, catalytic converter in your car and um, work towards uh, better emission controls and efficiency for these units as well. And uh, this is the parking lot uh, solar array 
uh, that exist today. So uh, again, in, in 2019, the construction concluded. Um, On-site testing and simulations occurred for 30 days. Uh, this is time frame essentially proved up that the microgrid could, micro could deliver power uh, in a day ahead market scenario. Um, and the study of the project concluded that revenue opportunities uh, for the day ahead market and spot markets were limited. Um, and ultimately, PGE would not accept full interconnection uh, due to the incompatibility or compatibility of the inverter design. Um, full interconnection is not possible today uh, without a significant capital investment. Um, the grant funds are fully expended at this time, um, and no additional funding is available, of course, from Santa Rosa Water for this project. But Train did complete all of their grant requirements and submitted a final report to the California Energy Commission, um, basically addressing all of the requirements of the grant. Additionally, the uh, city did engage UC Davis to evaluate the, the pilot project as a third party evaluator. Uh, they looked at the proxy demand resource program, uh, otherwise referred to as a day ahead and real time market. Uh, they identified limited times a year when this program could be utilized. Of course, priority goes to the operations of the LTP during certain times of year, especially during the winter months. Uh, and they must be prioritized. So there's limited opportunity to manipulate those operations in a way uh, that could either reduce demand or uh, work in conjunction with the microgrid uh, to shift load. But they did determine ultimately that there could be opportunities that generate savings from about 1% to 7% of the energy costs uh, in 2017 dollars uh, through a combination of the demand response programs. And the ability to shift those loads and still meet the regulatory and treatment plan operation requirements uh, was deemed to be challenging, and that was an outcome of that study. In the meantime, uh, the city has began participating in PG&E's base interruptible program. Uh, it is a program where a it's an uh, optional program where a scheduler notifies the LTP operations staff uh, that they are going to make a call for reduced demands on the grid um, and offers the opportunity to participate. Uh, this is, again, fully optional. If it's not a good day for doing so, uh, staff do not have to respond. Uh, so it's a fully elective program, and there's no penalty for not participating in the events. Uh, but these are really when the grid is most vulnerable city, statewide, and it's an opportunity to reduce that demand uh, and prevent blackouts or brownouts on the grid. So, um, And then the LTP has certain elements and SOPs in place whereby they can put certain things in standby, uh, reduce the demands overall in the plant, and get paid back uh, for reducing that demand on the grid as a large energy user. Uh, right now, the program is estimated to uh, give the, city, uh, the utility about 40,000 to 80,000 annually uh, for this participation. Uh, the past few quarters have resulted in about $13,000 per quarter. So to why we're here today, uh, the operations of the pilot project have concluded in 2019, um, and due to costs and the capital investment needed, uh, interconnection with the grid is not recommended by either train or Santa Rosa water staff. And really, at this point, what we've learned, for, based on what we've learned, uh, train and Santa Rosa water staff uh, recommend the termination of the project and removal of certain elements of the project, including the microgrid, transformer, and inverter. Uh, train would be responsible for all permits and necessary approvals to complete the work under this agreement. Uh, train will remove these project elements at no cost to Santa Rosa Water and return that site back to satisfactory conditions uh, according to on-site staff. 
and ownership of the solar array and the SCRs for which uh, Santa Rosa contributed uh, obviously remains with Santa Rosa Water after they remove those elements. Uh, there are some ongoing benefits uh, to Santa Rosa Water from engaging this project uh, despite the removal of the microgrid. Uh, we no longer need to perform the maintenance on the microgrid, which is estimated at about $25,000 annually. Uh, and it is uh, somewhat uh, dangerous work um, because it is high voltage electricity as well. So there is some, some risk there too as well. Uh, the installation of the two SERs, uh, we got those for the price of one um, when the grant was put together. Uh, and it has resulted in further maximized operations of the combined heat power uh, generation facilities. Um, and the completion of the 125 kilowatt solar array, which does offset some demand for the facilities and provides shade in the parking lot as a result as well. So with that, um, the agreement f for which uh, is in the packet today, Santa Rosa Water staff are recommending the Board of Public Utilities uh, by motion approve the right of entry and access agreement for the removal of the microgrid demonstration project battery, transformer, and inverter at the Santa Rosa Laguna treatment plant, uh, that agreement being between the City of Santa Rosa and TRAIN. With that, I can take any questions the board may have. Thank you for your presentation. It's unfortunate that this uh, project didn't uh, become successful, but I think this is a, a good way to conclude it. And we did get the solar array and, and a couple other uh, pieces of equipment. So uh, I'm supportive of the agreement. I'll open it up for board member questions or comments. Vice Chair Arnone. Thanks. I would also agree that it's been a worthwhile project uh, given the final results. But I, the question I have, and it's probably just because of my lack of knowledge, is I, I thought that it was necessary to have an inverter to make use of solar panels. And if we're giving the inverter back to train, how, how is it possible that we're able to use the energy from the solar panels without an inverter? That's a good question, Vice Chair Anony. Um Actually, the inverter is compatible with the uh, microgrid itself. So when the microgrid uh, discharges the power, it would need to run through the inverter in order to return back uh, to the um, to, to the grid. Uh, I do believe uh, I may have to call upon uh, Deputy Director Prenz or uh, maybe Director Burke, but I do believe that the solar array is, is operated somewhat separately um, from from that microgrid in, uh, in terms of how they work in concert. So I don't know if somebody needs to confirm that or not. but. It's been a while since I was involved with the project, but my understanding is, is it is separate and it doesn't provide enough energy to go back to the grid, so we're using it on site. Well, as that long as we can use it on site, that's good. I mean, I'm, I'm glad to hear we can use it on site. <clears throat> Other board member questions or comments? All right, I will entertain a motion. Mr. Chairman, I'll make a motion. I move that uh, the Board of Public Utilities approve the agreement um, for the right of entry and access for removal of the battery transformer and inverter at the Santa Rosa Laguna treatment plant between the City of Santa Rosa and Train US Incorporated. I'll second that. We have a motion by Board Member Walsh, seconded by Board Member Bartholo. At this time, I'll open it up for public comments on item 7.2. If you wish to make a comment via Zoom, please raise your hand. If you're dialing in via telephone, please dial star nine to raise your hand. Secretary Ledesma. We have no one at the podiums. No hands are raised on Zoom and no voicemails or emails were received. All right, may we have a roll call vote, please? Board Member Walsh. Aye. Board Member Bartholo. Aye. Board Member Badenfort. Aye. Vice Chair Arnone. Aye. Chair Galvin. Aye. This passes with five affirmative votes and board members Watts and Wright absent. Thank you. Thank you again, Deputy Director Martin. We'll now move to item 7.3, Director Burke. 
Thank you, Chair Galvin and members of the board. Our final report item is a contract award for the Albany, Clement, and Milano Sewer and Water Improvements. And Rochella Maeda, Associate Civil Engineer with our Capital Projects team, will be making the presentation. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Galvin and members of the board. As Director Burke mentioned, my name is Rochelle Amayeta and I'm an Associate Civil Engineer with the Transportation and Public Works Department. Today, I will present the contract award for the Albany, Clement, and Milano Sewer and Water Improvements Project, contract number C00203. As I will discuss, due to scheduling constraints related to bidding and right-of-way issues, I am bringing forth the contract award in accordance with resolution number 900, titled Resolution of the Board of Public Utilities, authorizing a specific process for expedited construction contract award. I'll start off with a little bit of a project background, a portion of which is located on Santa Rosa Junior College property. So I'll talk about securing those easements and why that's relevant to the contract award. I'll go over the project schedule. I'll touch on how we structured the invitation for bids to allow for flexibility in scoping the contract. I will present the bid opening results and finally end with a recommendation. The project is located just east of Highway 101 and south of Steel Lane. The purpose of the project is to replace water facilities that have been identified as having a high likelihood of failure and being fire flow deficient. It will also replace, age, replace aged and undersized sewer mains, as well as upgrade existing storm drain facilities and replace a few, excuse me, a few pedestrian ramps to make uh, with ADA compliant ones. Zooming into the project area and starting at the top in the pink area is where we have some minor storm drain improvements, about 120 or linear feet and several catch basin, basins. The blue area indicates where we have some water main replacements, about 1,900 linear feet. And then the green area indicates where we have about 1,400 linear feet of sewer main replacements. And then with those sewer improvements, we will be able to abandon an existing private sewer, sanitary sewer easement. Since the project will be improving multiple utilities within the roads, we will be doing full roadway reconstruction, which means that we will be replacing a total of eight new uh, ADA compliant ramps. Towards the right, that yellow box indicates where we have SRJC's property boundary. So as you can see, a portion of the water mains are located on their campus. To do the improvements on SRJC properties, we need both a temporary construction easement as well as a permanent easement, both of which need to be approved by their board. And then to minimize disruption to the college, construction on the campus would be restricted to when school is not in session, with summer breaks really being the only practical window, uh, windows to do the work that's expected to take about six weeks. Uh, last month, SRJC's administrative staff and their legal counsel preliminarily approved the easement documents, so we decided to target this summer for construction. And this could prevent the project from lasting an extra six to nine months, um, which could increase impacts to the neighborhood as well as the total project cost. We will direct the contractor to start this portion of the project as the first order of work. And this doesn't mean they won't be able to work on other portions of the project. It just means that the SRJC property uh, needs to be a priority. For construction on SRJC's property to begin at the start of summer break, we identified mid-April as the latest date to advertise the project. We ended up advertising on April 18th. And as you can see, we needed to advertise the project uh, before we were able to get on SRJC board meetings agenda. So we did not know if we would have SRJC rights at the time. And I'll talk a little bit more that, about that on the next slide. Uh, but continuing on with schedule, after SRJC's May 9th board meeting, we had a bid opening on May 10th. I'm here before you today requesting approval to award the contract. Construction is anticipated to begin in mid-June with the SRJC portion of work uh, being done in late July or early August. And again, if something happens and we cannot complete construction this summer, we do already have rights to do the work next summer as well. 
As I mentioned, we structured the invitation for bids uh, to accommodate the uncertainty with SRJC's property rights. We included all work on SRJC property as an additive bid item, meaning that we got a completely separate cost for this portion of work, and then we could decide after we opened bids whether or not we wanted to include it in the contract. According to public contract code, we do need to state in the invitation for bids how we would determine the low bid. And so since we weren't certain that we would have SRJC rights, we opted to have the low bid be based on only the base bid without consideration of the SRJC portion of work. Again, we advertised on April 18th of this year. The easement documents were approved by SRJC's board on May 9th. We received a total of five bids on May 10th, and the apparent low bidder was Terracon Constructors Incorporated. Looking, looking more closely at Terracon Constructors' estimates, they had a base bid of about $2.9 million, which was approximately 5% over the engineer's estimate. The additive bid item, or the portion of work that was on the SRJC campus, came out to about $329,000, which was approximately 46% over the engineer's estimate for that portion of work. But because it was such a small portion of the total project, Terracon Constructors still actually had the lowest total crop project cost of about $3.2 million. It is recommended by the Transportation and Public Works Department and the Water Department that the Board of Public Utilities, by motion, approve the project, award construction contract number C00203 in the amount of $3,233,289 to the lowest responsive bidder, Terracon Constructors Incorporated of Healdsburg, California for the Albany, Clement, and Milano sewer and water improvements, approve a 15% contingency, and authorize a total contract amount of $3,718,282.35. Thank you for your time, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you for your presentation and for getting this project moving quickly. I'll open it up for any board member questions or comments. All right, then I will entertain a motion. I'll make a motion <clears throat> to, um, to approve the project and to award construction contract number C00203 in the amount of $3,233,289 to the lowest responsive bidder, Terracon Constructors of Healdsburg for the Albany, Clement, and Milano sewer and water improvements and approve a 15% contingency and authorize a total contract amount of $3,718,282.35. I'll second that motion. We have a motion by Board Member Bartholo, seconded by Board Member Walsh to approve item 7.3. At this time, we'll open it up for public comment on item 7.3. If you wish to make a comment via Zoom, please raise your hand. If you're dialing in via telephone, please dial star 9 to raise your hand. Secretary Ledesma. We have no one at the podiums, no hands are raised in Zoom, and no voicemails or emails were received. May we have a roll call vote, please? Board Member Walsh. Aye. Board Member Bartholo? Aye. Board Member Badenfort? Aye. Vice Chair Arnone? Aye. Chair Galvin? Aye. This passes with five affirmative votes and Board Members Watts and Wright absent. Thank you. We'll now move to item number eight, which is public comments on non-agenda items. We'll take public comments now on item eight. If you wish to make a comment via Zoom, please raise your hand. If you're dialing in via telephone, please dial star nine to raise your hand. Secretary Ledesma. We have no one at the podiums, no hands are raised in Zoom, and no voicemails or emails were received. Thank you. Uh, we have no written communications. I don't believe we have any subcommittee reports. Do we have any board member reports? Board member Walsh. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I was able to attend uh, the eco-friendly garden tour Saturday, May 15th. And uh, I want to thank the folks that put it together. The signups were really easy. The sponsor helped people make sure that they could get where they needed to be. And one project in particular pointed out some of the things that we're working on. <clears throat> it was called uh, Matanzas Creek Natives. Each, uh, each garden had their own kind of theme. 
and Matanzas Creek natives on, was on Cypress Way. The front yard was great. They had a lot of low water native plants. The backyard was great. They had these catchment catchment facilities, and then people were saying, what's that? And they started walking down the stairs towards Matanzas Creek, and uh, the homeowner was explaining that originally a federal agency wanted to do a survey for endangered species and do some fish counts, and she said, well, I do have steps to provide the access that they wanted, but she was concerned that the slope may erode. And the project turned into sort of a creek bed restoration project where the that she had willows planted, and the ones that took stayed there, provided shade for the fry. Um, the neighbors, upstream neighbors, had a drainage pipe that was uh, was buried underneath their yard. It came, went from the street, I think, of the storm drains. I'm not that up on it, but the water flowed into sort of a ditch in their yard, slowed it down, fed the stream, and um, it was just fantastic. The people were amazed at how it looked, the sitting areas, um, and you know the the cooperation of the agencies involved. So I was really appreciative. So it took in stormwater creeks, um, wa doing water right, and the, and the fish counts, and it was just a fantastic project. It really wowed me on the cooperation. So I appreciate that and the folks that pull, pulled everything together. Great, thank you for that report. Any other board member reports? All right, well, we'll take, oops, I'm sorry. I also attended that event and um, I only was able to visit two of the gardens, but it was so well done. And the amount of information that was conveyed to all the people that participated um, was, was really amazing. Um, so hats off to everyone who helped with that. Thank you. Any other board member comments? All right, we'll take public comments on item number 12. If you wish to make a comment via Zoom, please raise your hand. If you're dialing in via telephone, please dial star nine to raise your hand. Secretary Ledesma. We have no one at the podiums, no hands are raised in Zoom, and no emails or voicemails are received. All right, that'll take care of item number 12. We'll now move to the director's report, Director Burke. Thank you, Chair Galvin and members of the board. I only have a couple items to report to you on. Uh, first, I wanted to give an update on our water future project. Uh, we continue to make progress on the Our Water Future project, which is our water supply alternatives plan. Uh, the project is remaining on schedule. A feasibility assessment of water supply options has been completed and a draft uh, technical memorandum was distributed to our internal water team as well as our external stakeholder group. The stakeholder group will have their next working session next week on Wednesday, May 24th. And then any input we receive from the stakeholder group as well as the review from the internal team will be ent integrated into the memo. And the initial feasibility study results will be presented at a community webinar on Monday, June 26th. And that's gonna be from 5 to 7 p.m. and will be a virtual meeting via Zoom. And then we will be coming to the board at your meeting on July 6th to present uh, the information to the BPU as well. So all updates, including information on how uh, members of the public can register and attend the June 26th community web webinar, pardon me, can be found on our website, which is srcity.org slash our water future. I also wanted to let the board know that we are um, excitedly moving forward with our direct install program. On Monday, May 22nd, uh, we will begin targeted outreach for the grant funded toilet direct install program and we'll begin opening up an online pre-qualification application. And Santa Rosa water customers will be eligible to swap out higher water use toilets with two high efficiency 0.8 gallons per flush toilets, as well as high efficiency shower heads, faucet, aer faucet aerators, and uh, kitchen faucet aerators. Uh, the fixtures will be completely installed uh, for the customers by qualified plumbers and there will be no cost to the customer. 
And as you might recall, this is a grant funding that we received not only through a um, earmark from our local assembly member, as well as um, funding that we will be receiving through a Bureau of Recreation grant. So our goal is to begin installation in late summer. And if anyone is interested to either get more information or information on how they can pre-qualify for the program, please visit our website at srcity.org slash toilets. And then last, I wanted to let the board know that we will be canceling the June 1st BPU meeting. So our next meeting will occur on June 15th and you will see a cancellation notice um, posting soon. And that is my report and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Director Burke. Any board questions for the director? Vice Chair Arnone? Actually, this is not a question, and I sh probably should have brought this up at the, the board member comments period, but I'm going to bring it up now. <laughs> and I just wanted to share a, a fact that uh, a couple of weeks ago, we had a leak in our drip system in the backyard, and we discovered it. It was pooling up, and we called somebody to come in and fix it, and, and it took a few days to, to get the person on board. But just the day that they fit, did the work, uh, we got a phone call from Santa Rosa Water that said, you have a water leak. And and we took the call and said, well, we just have somebody come fix it. In fact, he just fixed it today. And they said, okay, wait for a minute. And they checked and apparently online in real time, they said, yep, it stopped, you're all good. And if you wanna have a, uh, a reduction in your water bill because of all the water that uh, was lost, <clears throat> we'll send you the paperwork and you should be receiving it shortly. And, and we received it. So it's just uh, you know something that I, I experienced that I was very impressed by, the immediacy of picking it up because it was like two or three days after the leak started that uh, that we got the call. So it was just a, a very good example of some of the investments in real-time monitoring um, paying off for the rate payers, which I am one. So uh, that was it. Well, well, thank you for those comments. Um, I will note that the AMI system has been very helpful um, to both our water billing and water use efficiency teams. I'm guessing you probably got a call from our water billing team to let you know. And uh, yes, if you uh, find a leak, you repair that leak, we can work with you on whether or not you would qualify for a leak adjustment. So uh, I'm glad that worked out well and they got you the information and kudos to the water billing and water use efficiency teams. Very good, any other questions or comments? Then we'll uh, open it up for public comment on item 13. If you wish to make a comment via Zoom, please raise your hand. If you're dialing in via telephone, please dial star nine to raise your hand. Secretary Ledesma. We have no one at the podiums, no hands are raised in Zoom, and no voicemails or emails were received. Thank you. That concludes our agenda for today, so I'd like to adjourn the meeting in honor of our water professionals. I hope they have a great uh, week next week since we won't be meeting, and uh, kudos for a job well done. We're adjourned. <laughs>